Well, no pressure then at all. And you stole all my best lines. Sorry, Dish, we can just go now. <laughs> can we go home? Yeah. Good to see the chair has as good a sense of humour as, as he has. So good afternoon from, from both of us. It's great to be here and our thanks to Simon and Victoria for inviting us. So why are we here? Well, for years, Ian and I had ha been having this conversation with anybody else we could bore on the topic as well, belly aching over the condition of the Southern Irish Protestant. Who exactly were we about the time and of and immediately after independence? Were we the unionist discontent with being beached on the wrong side of history and of the border? Or were we pale green nationalists, like my family, uh, broadly happy to be part of the new order of things? Or were we somewhere in between? Or even apolitical? Uh, we didn't broadly leave en masse, as we heard this morning. And that that didn't happen speaks to a desire, or necessity, to stay in this new Ireland, spinish, spinning itself as an old and Gaelic one. That's how our, our edited collection of exploratory essays, Protestant and Irish, the Minority's Search for Place in Independent Ireland, came to be born. We expected it to be a quiet little book, a thing that would stick on academic shelves in the usual way of mm. academic essay collections and costing about 80 or 100 quid. And instead, we went to Cork University Press, who produced this very brash teenager, this beautiful book, um, which even has a green and gold spine thread. Um, so it's a kind of a look at me book, which has both provoked criticism and mutterings of timely in equal measure. And actually about that, we're very pleased because we really did want it to be the beginning of a conversation. So it's timely in a number of ways, not least because of the context of Brexit, which is, of course, the sundering of a long lived political union and resonates today with what was happening in these islands 100 years ago. Uh, new conversations are opening, and that's what we really wanted to do. The idea of a conversation is nearly as important as the conversation itself. Historians should be about asking questions of society, not always finding answers. As well as the expected review by the Irish Times, it has stimulated fascinating and sometimes difficult exchanges on the web. And we kind of read them like this, saying, what are they going to say now? But it's usually been really interesting. Mm. Take, for example, the robust interchange provoked by Gerald Dawes' very personal and appreciative review in the Slugger or Tool blog, which seemed to encapsulate all the sides we're trying to cover. Or the lively three-way colloquium in the a April edition of the Dublin Review of Books between John Horgan, Robbie Ralston and Niall Meehan. We wanted to show uh, that the Protestant story was about donuts, about substance, not about holes. Or perhaps scones and jam. Sorry, scones and jam mm -hmm. for my tradition. Uh, as Simon had entertainingly noted in a review of the book in the British political magazine's standpoint. Or perhaps even tray bakes which I've um, had um, the tongue-in-cheek um, attitude to, to suggest we make, or that some of us make, but don't consume, not me, thereby assisting our apparently greater longevity. So here today, we'll relish your thoughts on these matters as much as the scones and jam. It's scones, actually. But anyway. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> For you? It's appropriate, I suppose, to have this conversation in West Cork, seen by many as the cockpit of a sticky, difficult and often tragic time in the history of Protestant Ireland at the cusp of independence. That's been gone over in detail by historians and controversialists and histrionicists to adopt something that Eunan said this morning, and perhaps the exhaustion of fighting to a standstill is close upon us. While not downplaying the significance to specific families and localities, we are fond of quoting Belfast-born Southern Unionist uh, historian Arby McDowell's cool judgment that, in relation to the 1919-23 period, quote, hardships sustained by the Southern loyalists were on the whole not excessively severe nor long-lasting. That gels with the wider perspective. Just look at the fate of other similar minorities after the Great War, from Russian aristocrats to Germans in Silesia and Jews in Germany. Southern Protestants got away, it seems, without much murder. Nevertheless, there is still within some elements of the Protestant community homage to a sensitivity to a presumed memory of murder, persecution and flight. That complex sensitivity is real to those who experience it, and it must be respected as such. 
Those complexities and nuances are illustrated in our own family stories. Each of us comes from the Southern uh, Protestant tradition, but there the similarities end. I come from mostly tenant farming stock in County Wexford, and most of my antecedents have been there as Protestants in the southeast for, for about 400 years. Date that back and you'll get the clue. Our land was right beside the rebel camps in 1798. My grandfather, as I mentioned this morning, had a grave dug by the IRA twice, and twice the neighbours persuaded the IRA to fill it back in again. He was selling straw to the British Army. Both in 1798 and uh, during the, 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 the more recent period, they were protected by Catholic neighbours. Ian's ancestor was a Williamite soldier who was given a small grant of land near Bunratty in County Clare. The family fell on hard times after the Napoleonic Wars. He says it's due to alcoholic drink and agricultural depression. And in, but, but eventually they married into Catholic merchant money and uh, moved to Dublin as loyal castle Catholics. Ian's grandfather was educated in Dublin's Catholic University School and worked for the very um, Catholic National Bank, and, but was nevertheless mo moved in Protestant social and sporting circles. He married back into the Protestant tradition in 1918, ignored Nate Emery. I think a lot of people had a lot of fun making sure Nate Emery didn't work very well, and allowed his children to be brought up as Anglicans. Protestants in the Irish Free State and Republic have been seen, or perhaps unseen, as Ireland's invisible and forgotten minority. Comprising less than 7% of the post-independence population and shrinking, they found themselves facing an aggressive national Catholicism, now freed from external constraint. In William Trevor's Ballroom of Romance, Catholic tolerance danced uneasily with Protestant standoffishness, and any Protestant desire to belong was often rejected by Catholic exclusivity. Given Protestants' presumed political unionism and the traumas of the War of Independence <coughs> and the Civil War, it seemed sensible to keep the head down. Despite a few headline acts like Douglas Hyde, their entirely natural instinct was to maintain a low, even sometimes a cringing, profile to protect their substantial privileges. Firms and farms, schools, a university, hospitals, social sporting and charitable organisations. Most Protestants were content to live quietly, seeing that as offering an example of model citizenship. As the Bishop of Limerick put it in 1944, quote, to express a method of living valuable to the state. We felt that few had told that downplayed story, our story, of the Protestant <coughs> fitting in, living in harmony with their neighbours, inconspicuously keeping that head down, not out of, out of a sense of unease, but because things were just fine and it suited. And then the material that came for the, that for the book that came back from our essays introduced us to some of our own blind spots and sometimes to our discomfort. So just as we felt others were not writing about our sort of Protestant, the unassuming farming families of the southeast, or what Ian calls the smug suburban middle classes of Dublin, we realised we needed to uh, widen our definition of fitting in for the book. So in response to an acknowledgement of the complexities and traditions of our tribe, we've tried to show a broad spectrum of how Protestants, gruntled or disgruntled, sought to find and often found place in the New Ireland, either noisily or through keeping that head down. We wanted to show, as Christopher Cassan put it in the book's review in the Irish Times, that narrow narratives do no justice to our history. In reading the book, if you have a bit of a laugh and recognition that the 26 county Protestant condition you know or come to understand just a little bit better the one you don't, then we'll have succeeded. That's if you buy it. In the 1950s, contrarian Protestant essayist Hubert Butler described the Church of Ireland as, quote, a poor old phoenix, molting and blind and bedraggled, gazing mesmerised into the fire, but unable to summon up the courage to take the last leap. Yet, he continued, I still think it has the power to lay a very fine egg. In our book, we hope you'll find some of Butler's eggs. Comprising 18 essays by scholars with individual perspectives on Irish Protestant history, it explores ways in which the Bishop of Limerick's methods of living were carried out. That wasn't easy to do. Protestants as part of the citizenry weren't always accepted, and it has to be said, sometimes still aren't. The term Protestant had religious and denominational connotations, obviously, but it carried a lot of other baggage as well. It held serious overtones of an inherited difference, an almost genetic otherness. If you were Protestant, there were things you couldn't possibly be, positions you couldn't possibly hold. A recent incident from Dunmanway, which is possibly a 
apocryphal. The town's main claim to fame, of course, is the home of Sam McGuire, he of the GAA trophy and a Republican, but also as a Protestant, as you know. Not a long time ago, it is said that a group of GAA supporters wondered if Maguire, buried beside St. Mary's Church of Ireland, shouldn't be reinterred in a Catholic churchyard, as wasn't he really one of us? I'd say Cliff, Cliff Jeffers had something to say about that. There's lots already written about Southern Protestants after independence, largely reflecting uh, the image of a ghetto, aloof from Ireland, the Ireland in which they lived, and subject to a, nar a narrative of decline, descendancy, despondency, depression, Dostoevsky in a, in, in a particular Irish context. That, though while it has its validity, is no means, by no means the whole story. The essays in our volume take a different approach. They start from the premise that this formerly dominant and visible minority actually survived quite well. In the main, Southern Protestants largely uh, uh, evaded identifying with Northern Irishness or with Englishness. And this despite popular jibes, like we've all had uh, the casual abuse, go back to where you came from, to which my response is usually lovely. I'd know, love to know where, do tell me, because we've been here so long we don't know. Much as the four uh, female members of the US Congress have recently been told and responded in similar vein. They're already back just like us. Uh, but most of us stayed after independence because we didn't see ourselves as belonging anywhere else. It helped that the elites amongst us preserved our economic, cultural and social status without too much disruption or cost and continued to have a considerable influence in certain aspects of independence Ireland's life, even if our political power was close to negligible. The period we cover in the book is that of the, of the reassessment and cautious restabilisation which began with the establishment of the Irish Free State and ended in the 1960s. By then, as Eugenio Biagini has written about Irish Methodism, quote, there was a new sense of ease and satisfaction with conditions in the Republic. From the 1960s, the state and its accompanying political climate was changing or was perceived to be changing just as important. It may have uh, still been a chilly place for some Protestant, Protestants in the early 1960s, but the temperature was improving. Literally, as central heating was more characteristic of the decade than sectarianism. Sensitivities were not what they were. In his 1967 autobiography, Patrick Campbell broke a cardinal rule by insouciantly quoting the slighting way his parents used to refer to Catholicism. But the interesting thing is that by 1967, Ca Campbell felt he could break it. The zeitgeist was undergoing a shift. State and nation were becoming more tolerant of plurality. They were open. It was economically secure. Jack White's 1975 volume, Minority Report, argued that ecumenism in religion, allied with the deletion of the article in the Irish Constitution relating to the special position of the Roman Catholic Church, represented clear markers between that and previous times. The Neytemery decree still exerted an influence, but youth on both sides was already beginning to query its premises and ignore its proscriptions. People were beginning to find their own accommodations, to bend the rules to live their lives. There's another volume, as, as, as Gillian has mentioned, to be written about Southern Protestantism in the turbulent years shaped by the Northern Irish conflict, economic booms and busts, and the Weberian secularization and what we might call the Protestantization of Irish Catholic society. But this one marks the end of a significant period of adjustment for the minority community in independent Ireland. So in the, in the opening to our book, Roy Foster discusses how Southern Protestants came to have a secure identity within independent Ireland, facilitated by the gradualism of independence as a process, not as an event. The fact that the free state was a dominion within the Commonwealth softened the impact of absorbing, absorbing its nationalist rhetoric, language obsession and semi-theocratic adoption of Catholic social teaching. Even de Valera's 1937 constitution could be accepted more easily since by that date, he was no longer seen as a demonic Lenin type figure. I'm not sure about that in my house. Even by the most nervous of Protestants, I was once put outside the door for doing a project in De Valera. My dad hated it. Moreover, the rights of non Catholics were at least formally recognized in the 1937 document. Had the declaration of a republic uh, followed hard upon the new constitution, uh, reactions might have been rather different. But again, there was a cooling off period of 11 years before Costello cut the links to the Commonwealth. By then, the identity of Southern Protestants was, as Foster puts it so well, more or less uncomplicatedly Irish. And as Foster says, there is little need to portray Southern Protestants as a former people in the poignant phrase applied to Russian aristocrats after 1917. They were much more resilient and robust than that. 
Rather, we are an element in Irish life whose Irish identity is unequivocal and who did not all share the uneasy feeling of ill-gotten historical privilege delineated in Elizabeth Bowen's autobiographical writings, for instance, and where dangling on the hyphen between Anglo and Irish seemed to represent an ambiguous identity. Even within the fortress of Trinity College, the sense of an anti-national identification seems more an invention of nationalist zealots than a reflection of the place itself, which, incidentally, the aforementioned Eamon de Valera seems to have held in more affection than he ever did UCD. The Protestant accent, if anyone remembers, even remembers it, is now long gone, along with Protestant cuisine, an unregretted subculture of a subculture, as Foster, with some feeling, <laughs> describes it. We're back to the tray bakes again. W.B. Yeats' speech in the Senate about the Irish Protestant contribution to intellectual and cultural life is well known. Less, lesser known, perhaps, is his brother Jack's salty aside that the Yeats family, quote, had no gate lodges or carriage drives. This applies to most of the people whose lives are reflected in our book. So, who were Protestants at independence? It suited the Catholic bulletin to see nothing but the tattered remnants of ascendancy, with Freemasons and Free Staters hiding under every bed. This simplistic view painted the Protestant communities as socially, culturally, politically, and e economically homogeneous. That representation was not, of course, confined to the bulletin. Even today, the pastiche images of the Irish Protestant as a fox-hunting landlord with the heart of the planter and the morals sh shaped by um, Droit de Seigneur had traction, as social media comments often reveal. You see them all too often. Mm. Yet historical analyses such as Fergus Campbell's The Irish Establishment place Protestants still at the epicentre of the elite at the cusp cusp of independence. But that masks the ordinariness of Protestants who were domestic servants, teachers, shop owners, shop assistants, policemen, nurses, farmers, poets, revolutionaries, industrialists, trade unionists, and even university lecturers. The professional and business classes living in suburban Rathmines and Dalkey, the orange tint of Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal, the Palatines of Wexford, my own people, and of Limerick, the farming communities in West Cork, Carlo, Wicklow, and the isolated Protestants of Kerry, Clare, and Mayo, all these demonstrate Protestantism as a much broader church than is often appreciated. We have very unique identities. The dominant Protestant denomination in the new state, powerful in its own world of schools, hospitals, and charities, was, unlike in Northern Ireland, the Church of Ireland. This had consequence. In the formative years of independent Ireland, the Church tended to make the pace when it came to asserting a distinctive Protestant ethic. That ethic was establishment-friendly, instinctively amenable to the status quo, whatever that was at any point in time. Other Protestant denominations moved to a different beat. Methodists, for instance, were less passive on the ground as they concentrated upon their evangelical mission with bicycles as their chariots, belief their armour, and devotional literature their weaponry. When the British presence had finally melted away, um, the inherent demographic weaknesses of the uh, indigenous Protestant community was, were exposed such as loss of future members, courtesy of Ney Temery, late marriage, a soupçon of surprisingly effective contraceptive practices, and migration. With numerical decline came serious issues of uh, a diminished group confidence, viability, and scale in the fields of education, health, and church organisation. Yet other demographic elements should not be ignored or minimised, such as the gender balance, emigration, and especially differing population densities. Viable pockets of Protestants existed in such as Dublin and here in West Cork, whereas amongst the isolated and fragmented communities and families in Kerry and Mayo, there was a very different worldview and group dynamic. That worldview was shaped not just by raw demography, but by the complexity of, complexities of Protestantism's social, cultural, and economic makeup. Relative Protestant prosperity may have been a cliché, but it was real. In 1916, uh, Cork, for example, uh, Protestants comprised a mere 7% of the population, but owned 70% of the motor cars. In the 1926 Free State, their position hadn't changed much with independence. With 7% of the population nationally, they owned over one third of the larger farms in over half the 26 counties. Relative prosperity was reflected again in the professions, with over half of the bankers, 40% of the lawyers, and one third of the doctors in 1926. Again, in the commercial world, Protestants were only 2% of the unskilled workforce, but made up 17% of the persons employed as employers, managers, and foremen. 
Perpetuation and protection of the Protestant economy signalled the vital interest that Protestantism had in how the economy of the new state was to be organised, especially in its tariff, taxation and land distribution policies, and in its attitudes towards education, the professions and the public service. It was important for them to be at the table. Social class and gender divisions were probably as significant within Protestantism as those between the denominations. A recent book by one of our contributors, an R.M. Smiley, legendary editor of the Irish Times, perceptively asserts that, quote, most of the snobbery of Dublin's Protestants was self-inflicted, directed not at Catholics, but at fellow members of the minority. If the Molesworth Hall in elegant South City Dublin had, in Elizabeth Bowen's phrase, a Protestant smell, a universe away was a more pungent odour and a different class of admixture characterised by Sean O'Casey's Betty Burgess in the play um, Plough on the Stars. A loud-mouthed, drunken uh, Haridan, she lived in the same tenement building as the Catholic Nora Clitheroe, while seemingly forever baiting her, cast, her nationalist neighbour, O'Casey is Bessie siding with Nora when disaster strikes and class and gender solidarity is called for. But we should not be overly seduced by O'Casey's wishful invention. Looking at a typical North City working class Dublin street in the 1911 census, in this case North King Street, a mere 31 residents were Protestants in a total population of some 1,600. The actual opportunities to practice O'Casey's form of solidarity therefore may have been rather thin on the ground. Like anxious Irish Catholic ecumenists in the 1960s, wondering if there'd still be enough Protestants around to be ecumenical with. Uh, and that book by Caleb Richardson, it was actually reviewed in yesterday's Irish Times. So if Southern Protestants found themselves beached on the wrong side of the revolution, how were they to come to terms with that? They had perhaps a surprising advantage over Catholics who by and large had to operate within a, rigidly, uh, a relatively rigid and constricted religious and historically predetermined template with church and state always looking over their shoulders. Protestants, on the other hand, were freer to determine their own course. They were, by and large, left to their own devices, a fate which writer Sean F. Whelan dryly remarked in the 1940s was one that many Catholics actually envied. In January 1922, the Church of Ireland Gazette succinctly set the tone. It said, Unionism has, in any practical guise, ceased to exist in practical politics. We regret its passing unreservedly. But practical men must face facts, always men, of course. So practical is the watchword. That would work. And work at it they did, as Edna Longley remarked in 1989, that if Catholics were born Irish, Protestants had to work their passage towards Irishness if they wanted to. Our book mediates that passage through three prisms, belonging, engagement and otherness. This was no easy journey. The upheavals of the 1919-23 period had aftertones and echoes. In our essays, Brian Hughes examines, in the context of County Cavan, the Second Irish Grants Committee, which from 1926 to 1930 entertained compensation or what Union would call insurance claims. Those claims were largely predicated upon a particular interpretation of identity. This wasn't always clear-cut. Isabel O'Connor, an English Protestant, vaguely described herself as one of the lot they wished to drive out. Mary Fletcher was from the class which always supported British rule. So there was never a simple or, or single answer to allegiance and standing. Loyalty and religion could be variously codependent or mutually exclusive, shifting back and forth along a spectrum. Many Protestants, especially those outside the cocoon of wealth and privilege, retain stories often relating to earlier times of feeling marginalised in a society perceived as indifferent or even hostile to their, to their interests. Uh, Deirdre Nuttall's essay, uh, Deirdre's been doing really fantastic work uh, collecting Protestant memory in, in now uh, for, with uh, UCD Folklore Department. Her chapter identifies a common thread in the narratives of the less well-off Protestants, a feeling of public invisibility and the sense that the experience of being Irish and Protestant without wealth or status is unrecognised in Ireland's dominant historical story. These his feelings, though, often coexisted with intense feelings of Irishness and belonging. Protestants often felt excluded and marginalised in their local areas. Many defined themselves negatively, not Catholic, not Anglo-Irish, not wealthy, not recognised. Uh, one witness said, they didn't even see that we're here at all, revealing of her, herself as a Protestant at, at her job as a cleaner. Her colleagues didn't believe her, as she didn't look like a Protestant to them, they told her. You're not, love, you couldn't be. So that's the Sam Maguire syndrome again, somebody who be behaves out of the ordinary and in a different way. 
And developing a new understanding of their identity wasn't easy. In 1923, the Church of Ireland uh, Gazette lamented that it was all very well to say that loyalty can be transferred, but loyalty is an affair of the heart, and it's not possible to force the, the heart to follow the hand. In 1949, Protestants were faced with the constitutional fork on that loyal road. In an episode analysed by Miriam Moffat, the Church of Ireland on the Declaration of the Republic decided that it had to remove prayers for the British monarch from its services in the South. That challenged the Church of Ireland's sense of unity between the various segments of its membership, older and younger generations, northern and southern populations, nationalists and those still hankering after a connectivity with Britain and Empire. The episode opens a window upon notions of identity and belonging some quarter of a century after independence, especially how understanding their political and cultural identity was closely connected to their religious beliefs. Yet the state prayers controversy confirmed that a distinct shift had taken place within the Southern Protestant community. Changes in political attitudes had been embraced by a significant proportion of the Southern Protestant population, especially amongst the young. Moffat shows that a minority, often of more mature years, uh, and usually from urban elites, clung steadfastly to an ident identification with Britain and Empire w that, with the passage of time, was now out of line with political reality. This amalgam, this Briarland, was increasingly a place of fantastical construction to a younger generation. A minority within mon a minority found themselves sidelined as mainstream Protestant culture in Southern Ireland adjusted to an existence without the British comfort blanket. If there was a distinct but slow shift towards identity with a post-British Ireland, it was relatively passive. That suited. Irrelevance had little value, but visibility could carry a high price. The minor minority knew well that uh, the majority's benign toleration was only certain if they did nothing that would strain that toleration. Active engagement with the New Ireland was more problematically uh, problematical. In 1933, the Dean of Ross suggested of the Church of Ireland that her sons and daughters had taken part in everything that concerns the welfare of the country, and their only wish has been that a larger share of it should come into their hands. The problem with the Dean's wish was that it re represented a zero-sum game. Protestant gain could be perceived as Catholic loss. One way around this was to avoid the problem by creating a parallel uh, entity uh, within which uh, Protestants could exercise a sort of private citizenship, what Ian has described as the Protestant free state. Most, uh, mostly celebrated in private between consenting adults. This was a monarchical ed entity which still conversed in terms of Kingstown rather than Dunleary, Mal Maryborough rather than Portleash, Queenstown, not Cove, and in which the symbols of the royal cipher and post boxes and the use of British money was important, and which could legitimately toast the health of the king and curtsy to the governor general. One who aimed to redefine Protestant belonging to the new dispensation was Bolton Charles Waller. Conor Morrissey deals with it in his essay in the book. Journalist, soldier, public servant, pamphleteer, anti-sectarian campaigner, and laterally Church of Ireland clergyman, he did not retreat into convivial social networks post-independence, but embarked on a career that had three main objectives. First, the peaceful unification of Ar reunification of Ireland. Secondly, the revival of Protestant influence in public affairs. And thirdly, the promotion of a progressive internationalism, largely through the means of the League of Nations. As Waller's career showed, keeping the head down was not the only option. This leads into engagement, which is the second prism our book takes. In this, we feature some of the members of the ex-landlord class who showed, against the stereotypes, how Protestants in independent Ireland could bring the talents and resources at their disposal to make a life and a living, and what they could bring to the party. Tony Varley describes how Colonel George O'Callaghan Westrop of Clare and Bobby Burke of Galway tried to engage with contemporary Ireland through agricultural politics. Their trajectories were towards class politics, providing an entree to the Ireland that they themselves found in, while also an exit from the political and economic dead ends. At this uh, times, each did make significant headway and did acquire some traction on the basis of their activism. And Far from a landed class background be being an obstacle to, to both of them, to their emergence as public men, it became a valuable asset up to a point, but only up to a point. Boto Callaghan, Westrop's and Burke's career show the limits of social gentry origins into in integration into the new Ireland. Who they were could unleash exclusionary impulses, contributing to factionalism within the political entities of which they were part, and providing a fault line that could be exploited by opponents. 
Engagement could take many forms. Adaptive capability in the new state is exemplified by Trinity College Dublin, dealt with here by Tomás Irish, and capturing the subtle and disjointed journey that Trinity followed. One complication was that it was an example of what nationalists and Catholics railed against, but secretly aspired towards. Leyland Lyons claimed that the community within Trinity, much like uh, ex-unionists elsewhere, felt intense self-consciousness and that TCD constituted a ghetto in the new state. R.B. McDowell argued that from 1922, Trinity became an intellectual and social enclave in Dublin. In 1922, Sir Henry Wilson even suggested that Trinity should relocate to Belfast. Here's a thought. That may have been how it seemed from the outside looking in. From the inside looking out, however, there were intense debates as to how Trinity might adapt itself to the new political reality. The university became an example of the minority's chameleon-like, even parasitic qualities, which aided survival. And in 1947, de Valera's government gave the university a state grant for the first time, allowing it to prosper. The path by which it came to this position was difficult. Identity at the institution, built upon centuries of political, cultural and religious alignment with a cultural and political Britishness, was debated and contested within the college community. It was only through the slow passage of time and a careful but ambiguous engagement with the new government that Trinity reconciled itself to the new state. The point is, it eventually did. Frank Berry's essay uh, details how engagement worked or, or didn't in business and commerce. So this was a tale of two eras. Up to the 1960s, at least, most firms were known as either Protestant business or Catholic business. Uh, Mary Daly quotes businessman Michael Smurfett as stating that there are many companies where Catholics could never join the management team, no matter how good they were at their job or how considerable the contribution they could make. While Catholic firms such as Smurfett uh, found it difficult to make sales to Protestant companies. However, there now remains little trace, either in business or in the wider economy, of the divisions that were once so apparent at the foundation of the state and for some time afterwards. While Protestants, still, yeah, while, while Protestants still remained a privileged minority at the time of the EC entry in 1973, this was a reflection not of contemporaneous sectarianism, but of the glass floor that maintains the privileged position of those with inherited resources. Denominationally distinct workplaces had all but disappeared, long-established Protestant and Catholic firms had merged, and the era of tightly controlled family businesses was passed with modern management techniques and educational credentials replacing personal connections. Like firms up to the 1960s, associational culture tended to be strongly divided on denominational lines too, with class overtones. Denominational schooling set the pattern for post-school participation in such as rugby, hockey and racket sports. Hunting, golf and yachting and motor sports were more time and resource and, and money intensive. But the nature of this culture is revealingly exposed in the 1988 history of the Royal St George Yacht Club in Kingstown, which devotes only two of its 13 chapters to the actual sport of sailing. The rest is, in essence, the story of a gentleman's club. Uh, yacht clubs didn't exactly blend into the, the local community, and thankfully we didn't have any in Wexford, except a very small club. Uh, quite the opposite. But then there were other stories. My family engagement with the GAA, we had a hurling field on, 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 the, on the farm, it's actually called the hurling field, to this day, even though it no longer exists. And we had our own little club, and my father tells me it was all about getting tickets. Uh, persuaded me to search for similar stories through oral histories, when the sports historians uh, suggested there was little involvement. And I found with the help of um, people like uh, Tom Hunt, uh, my ex-husband Owen Curry, and even Donald McAnallen, a much bigger engagement than I had expected. Uh, GA wasn't every Protestant's thing, but it did exist. And it's no longer a hidden history, thanks to the oral histories I've collected and the, 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 the uh, material these people have given to me. Uh, as Senan Lillis, himself a former GA uh, Wexford selector, put it, GA involvement merged the whole community and teams and individuals organised themselves for the love of the little village. Parishes with a Protestant contingent contingent would in almost every case provide players for their local GAA clubs. This was taken for granted and no big deal was attached to this, he said. And he said the large amount of Protestant players that have won county medals in Wexford in all grades in hurling and football is testimony to this. And he said, and this was something that was repeated over and over again by my oral history interviewees, the jersey is all that matters, not your church. 
Southern Protestant involvement in the GA benefited both parties. If for Protestants it was done quietly, they did so out of the love for sport and as a way of fitting in with neighbours they couldn't join in church. Uh, for the GA, it was a rule book, they had developed a rule book that was so clear on disallowing discrimination. They don't take any um, religious affiliation or anything like that. Um, was a vital ease into the multi-ethnic and multi-faith society uh, that the Republic of Ireland has become. Uh, the North, of, co of course, is a very different country in relation to the GA. Mm -hmm. So much as somebody is said to enjoy bad health, so many Southern Irish Protestants rather enjoyed their otherness, which is the third strand in our volume. There are those who embraced otherness and those who had it imp imposed upon them. Protestant Republicans, especially activists in the revolutionary period, were double outsiders, excoriated by the vast majority of Protestants and exoticized by the Catholic nationalist world. And Martin McGuire uh, writes about those in, in, in our book, about 100 Protestant men and women involved in the revolution. He asks pertinent and sometimes uncomfortable questions. Are their statements coloured by a mentality that is specifically Protestant, for example? Do they propose a distinctively Protestant contribution to the Irish Revolution, a distinctively Protestant response to the post-revolutionary society that emerged? Maybe you'll go on to the next section. Keep on, keep on, keep on. I've lost it. If so, uh, were Protestants disillusioned at the Ireland that grew from their revolutionary activism? They might have opposed contemporary, contemporaneous constructs of imperialism, class and gender, but they were not in revolt against conventional, conventional Protestantism. A distinct and militant subculture of, of the young, most of them conformed to Pro Foster's idea of vivid faces, a generation in revolt against their parents and their class background, rather than their religion. Hubert Butler maintained that the contrarian and even revolutionary tradition, from Berkeley and Swift to Parnell and Blythe, was actually a Protestant one. And that's pushing it a bit, but it's worth considering the role of Protestantism as a grit in the revolutionary oyster. Where were the limits of otherness? Comparative history can shed light on this. Like several essays in the volume, this uses oral and documentary history. Neave Dillon investigates the motivation for Southern Protestants in Ireland and members of the British community in India to leave after their respective independences. She assesses how these two groups understood their sense of British identity in a colonial context. A tradition of cultural Britishness, whatever that might mean, and a strong ethos of imperial service, military and civil, are threads binding these peoplehoods together. One significant difference, though, was what constituted home. For the British in India, home was an ambivalent concept as they were rooted physically in India but imaginatively located in Britain. Not so for most Irish Protestants. Another major difference was more prosaic, the climatic environment. The British in India viewed it as potentially dangerous to both body and mind, whereas in, uh, in, in Ireland, excessive rainfall was pro mostly the worst that could befall Irish Protestants. Otherness could be sidestepped by separate, uh, sidestepped by separate development. Catherine O'Connor's study of the women of the Church of Ireland, uh, Diocese of Ferns, relies very heavily on oral histories, shows that the mixed marriage was one of the areas of life where demilitarized zones didn't work. Uh, her oral histories reveal that many women contested the cruelty of family division that sometimes resulted uh, from inter-church marriages. Given the natemory promise against the Catholic upbringing of children uh, from such uh, marriages, the struggle was to preserve identity by promoting inter-Protestant inter marriage and pro pro providing a vibrant Protestant community. And her essay shows that women played a vital role in this, for example, supervising the famous Protestant hops. But there's a complementary narrative. Catherine's interviews also show considerable cost community congeniality. In the Diocese of Ferns, all the women interviewed had lifelong Catholic friends and testified to excellent relations. Many were active in cross-community organisations, such as the Irish Country Women's Association, which was founded by Wexford Protestants. Um, incidents, though, such as the 1957 Fettered on Sea boycott were never a simple polarity between Catholic and Protestant interests, as is often portrayed, as Catherine shows. That polarity was, in fact, contested by both communities in 1957. There was a backstory as well as the front one. And it's taken me four years to teach him how to pronounce feathered. 
Um, otherness had two sides to it, of course. So how were Protestants perceived in the New Ireland? Aristotle defined wit as educated insolence, and that characterises the depiction of the Southern Irish Protestant in cartoons in Felix Lar Larkin's uh, picture essay in our volume. Of course, the cartoon lends itself to stereotype, and the obvious one is that of the choleric gentry. Uh, there were no Bercy Bessie Burgesses here. Suspicion of ex-unionist motives is clearly discernible in this cartoon uh, dated 1922 and entitled The Old Firm. More gentle is a cartoon in the Dublin Opinion called Cayley in the Kildare Street Club, published in 1934. It's, uh, you can look at all these afterwards, when we'll, we'll, we'll show them on the laptop. It's punchlines in the incongruity of what was still at that time a bastion of our Irish gentry and the Protestant professional classes hosting an event so redolent of the Irish Ireland cultural revival. The use of Irish language adds greatly to the general merriment, but there is also an almost kindly mockery, slightly patronising, only tempered by the merest hint of social envy. Nevertheless, it brings the Protestant outsider into sharp focus. Then the Irish Times cartoon, this delicious one, which you really have to look at in the books outside, from 1930 is a hoot. Most of the staff are wearing mortarboards, even the cleaners. And the two cleaning ladies in the middle, uh, one of them is asking the other, I'm applying for more pay for myself. Is that semicolon in the right place? And uh, there's also an italics inserter up on the right-hand side. What's so striking about these post-1922 cartoons, though, is how few there actually are. This speaks to, to the rather noticeable success of one Protestant survival strategy, relative invisibility, keeping the head down. And indeed, when they found themselves in the crosshairs of a cartoon to be treated as anachronisms and relics of old decency, as Latinists in the Rees Mogg mould, as jumpers and clumpers in the Kildare Street Club Cayley, it was preferable to being portrayed as people to be feared and hated, as landlords had been in the 1880s cartoon. Through humour, the cartoonists may have thus unwitting, unwittingly helped to lance the boil. Caleb Richardson dissects this further in our book, looking at it through the lens of a Protestant defence mechanism. It may seem inappropriate when telling the story of a once great minority's decline and fall. One would think, Richardson muses, that the great stock that produced Swift, Sheridan, Wilde and Somerville and Ross lost the ability to laugh on or about December 1921. But that's illusory. The fact that some of the finest fictional, fictional uh, chronicles of Protestant decline by Bowen, Johnson and Keane, amongst others, are also quite funny, seems to have been overlooked in the unrelenting search for the grand tragedy interpretation of Irish Protestant history. However, care was needed. In the case of Southern Irish Protestants, mm -hmm. a humour highlighting the group's superiority and incongruity could reinforce its sense that Southern Irish Protestants were somehow fundamentally different from the Catholic majority, while using humour as a release could serve as an excuse for not bothering to integrate oneself into Irish life. So comedy could reinforce tragedy. But it has its virtues too, critical thinking, empathy, patience, open-mindedness and tolerance. All of this is illustrated by Caleb in an enjoyable romp through the th Lord, third Lord Glenavy's Patrick Campbell's autobiography from 1967. And this starts with a long description of the death of his father, then goes on to describe Patrick getting involved in a horrific drink driving accident, being sent down from Oxford early, almost being strangled to death by brown shirts in 1930s Berlin, losing his sister in a flying bomb attack, getting divorced, you get the picture, being sacked from his dream job as a magazine and then from his, his fallback job, and only finding success as a TV personality better known for his stutter than his style. Um, so the book is, 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 is titled My Life in Easy Times, you sort of get the drift. Reading it would suggest a perfect capture of the experience of living with contradictions. And living with contradictions was the ex existential condition of Southern Irish Protestants after independence. In the 1930s, his, uh, Campbell's parents moved to Rockbrook in South Dublin. His father, the second Lord Glenavy, used to drive to the bus stop in Terenure, and on the way he experienced persecution and alienation of an entirely different kind, as Patrick remembered. He told me once with great pleasure, two little boys outside Doyle's cottage in the corner have it in for me. Every time they see the car coming, they yell, there Thor and Davy, throw the mud. And they do. His normally gloomy face shone for a moment with pure delight. There was more to the Southern Irish Protestant experience than grand tragedy. And Patrick Campbell reminds us of this in a way that few other writers can. 
We bring the collection of essays to a conclusion with a thoughtful afterword by Joe Rouen, where he compares and contrasts the condition of French and Irish Protestants. Like their Irish counterparts, French Protestants are a generally prosperous minority, but they're not as sheepish and unassertive as Southern Irish Protestants are often seen to be. And the French president recently un un unequivocally lauded their contribution to, to French national life. French Protestants have a heroic narrative, uncomplicated by ambiguous loyalties or apol apologies and allegiances. And that's perhaps one reason why, since independence, Southern Irish, uh, Southern Protestant engagement in the polity was largely confined, was largely through individual witness, not collective will, local, not national. With an ambiguous identity and, and belonging with baggage, treating engagement and otherness as essentially a private matter facilitated the survival of the tribe as a whole. It has had the merit of allowing Protestantism as an ism to avoid potentially damaging institutional and confessional clashes with the other. But that political context is changing. Brexit, like hanging, is concentrating minds wonderfully, not least on the possible question of Irish reunification. Joe points out that Southern Protestants, though small in numbers, are an important part of the political geometry of the island, and one reason why we really wanted to do this book. Their trajectory since 1922 has something to say to their northern co-religionists. If the latter can listen to the Protestant experience, uh, lived Protestant experience in uh, this state, and if perhaps they might re read our book. If a 32-county Ireland, and we wrote this quite a long time ago, and we've seen this mentioned by the Taoiseach in the last few days and by Frank McNally in the Irish Times and others, but if a 32-county Ireland is ever to be on the cards, all of us need to be uh, persuaded, uh, prepared to change our perceptions, our pre-perceptions of how that might be achieved and to get our heads over the parapet and work towards it. Thank you. <laughs>